we thank you for uh, just the gift and the privilege of being able to be here together, to be among our friends, our family, our brothers and sisters. And so tonight we just offer you this time and say, Lord, would you come and have your way? And so as we enter into a time of worship, would you just help us to fire our hearts and come into the posture of letting go and just opening ourselves up to the movement of your spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. So as we enter into worship, I invite you to stand. So I'm glad we just welcome your spirit into this place, Lord God. We are here for you and you alone. For you alone, Lord God. And you are worthy to be praised.
Will be done.
Highlands and some from uh, a different church too. So it's just really, really nice to be here as a church family. So thank you for all being here. Um, today we're going to be continuing our series called Becoming Our True Selves. And we've been going through the book of Ephesians. And so we're really glad that Michael could be here to carry that series on. Um, just to start us off, we have a few announcements. So our morning service, Pastor Kevin, who's our senior lead pastor here at Anaheim Free Methodist Church, uh, he announced that on April 1st, uh, we're lifting our uh, mask mandate. So we're just going with CDC guidelines, and that's going to be effective um, again uh, the first of next month. And so those will be optional. Uh, then uh, we also wanted to point out on anaheimfmc.org, our website, we have a new tab under giving, and now you can choose to go under the general fund slash revive, and uh, if you want to do online tithes or offerings, uh, that's now available. Also, we will always have a little box at the back by the sound booth, and so yeah, we're just really thankful for um, the tithes and offerings to keep this going, and also um, to help fund something that I'm going to announce, and this is the first time announcing it out in public. We're really, really excited. If you know about this, you know how excited I am about this. Um, but on July um, 17th through the 22nd, we're going to be having our very, very first Revive Retreat up at Redwood Camp. And so let that sink in because we haven't had camp in three years, but we're so excited for that. And um, originally, it was going to just be a youth camp, and so the youth are still going there, so if you have kids or, um, you know, people that you would know that you would want to send 6th graders to 12th graders, um, we would love for them to be there. But if you're college, post-college or adult, um, our superintendent, um, Keith, uh, actually, uh, when he met with me a few weeks ago, he had said, Lauren, uh, we have some extra spaces why don't you do a revive camp? And I was kind of taken back, um, and I didn't even know revive was really on his radar, but he said, yeah, you can have those spaces, what do you think? So I talked to our revive core team here, talked to the pastoral staff at Anaheim, got the green light, and we've been working on it, and we're so, so excited to uh, have our very first revive retreat up there. So if you're interested, uh, we just nailed down our camp theme, and our camp first. And so our theme uh, kind of came to me about a week and a half ago. And I felt as I was praying, um, you know, I don't know if this is something that you struggle with, but sometimes when you're praying or when you're in the word, you just have a million different things that you're thinking of, right? And it's hard to just kind of dial in. I'm always thinking about the next step or the next thing on my to-do list. And very audibly, I just felt like God was just saying, just, be, just be, and it kind of took me off guard, and it was a funny juxtaposition because almost every day of the week, if I'm not in like preaching pants or um, you know like church attire, I'm in Nike, I'm in just leggings, or I'm in my sweats, <laughs> I'm doing meetings from my home, and you know Nike is just do it, right? Just do it, and that's my mentality of life. I go forward things. I love to create new things. Uh, I love to just accomplish different things. Um, but God was just saying, one, it's not just do it, it's just be. And I thought, wow, God, that is so profound. And sometimes that is so opposite of who I am, but everything that I want to be. And so we're taking um, this theme of just be, and we're rooting it from Psalm 4610, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Be still and just be. And so that is the theme for our Revive Retreat. And we would love for you to join us up at camp. It's going to be a really wonderful week from Sunday to Friday. Um, to just be in God's presence, um, to be nestled in the redwoods, to be there in community, and with a mission to just be closer with God and closer with people. So I hope you could join us for that. I'm really excited to announce that. 
Um, and lastly, um, we have our very next meeting for Revive in person the Sunday after Easter, which is April 24th. And if you haven't gotten one yet, um, our graphic designer, Lindsay, um, she made these beautiful flyers and so it has all of our in-person events. You can just stick it on your fridge. And we also have some special events. Um, we have a worship night coming up and then of course we have camp in here too. So uh, thank you so much for just soaking that all in. Again, we are excited for what the Lord is doing and he is calling us to have that hope future hope and to just be. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer as Michael gives us our message today. Lord Jesus, you are so good. I pray that right now we can be still and know that you are God. That we can breathe you in can pause and just be. May we be in your presence. May we recognize how our heart is beating at a certain rate. May it be the same beat as yours. May we align our hearts with yours on this day, God. So Lord, again, we say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. May we have eyes and ears and hearts to be open to what you have to say through Michael's message. And Lord, may we hear your voice your powerful, authoritative, yet still voice. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, good evening, Revive family. I am so excited to be here, and I love Revive. I remember I came before, you know, I've been shut down, but when you think of Revive, I think it's a great opportunity to be authentic, to be genuine, to be transparent and honest, not with yourself, and not with those around you, but also with God. I just remember going, like, man, like, this is great. I felt like when I met Levi, I can be who I am. It doesn't matter how far away from God I was or how close. It doesn't matter you know, what I was doing in life. But when I was at Levi, I felt like this was worse, where I was supposed to be. I hope today we all feel that. I hope today we experience something that you know, we haven't been able to have in a long time. I'm very excited that I'm also honored that I get to be the first speaker um, of, the, of the 2020 year. So a little bit about myself, Pastor Lauren and Michael already mentioned that my name is Michael. I go to Mission Valley Free Methodist Church, and I am the youth coordinator for our high school and middle school students. But more about me is that I love playing basketball, I love watching basketball, I am a huge LA Clippers fan. You have any Clippers fans in here? How awkward. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's okay. I, I, Clipper fans of the day I die. Um, no, I love going fishing with my dad, that's something we've always done. We've gone to Mammoth, we've also gone to Mexico and deep sea water fishing. I also love keeping fish, for those of you who know me, I have a bunch of aquariums at home. And that's something I just got into this past year. But that's a little bit about myself. So today we're going to be talking about, or we're going to continue Ephesians, and we're going to be talking about a higher calling. As Christians, we know that there's a higher standard for us to live. We know that God holds us accountable and holds us to a higher calling because we are capable of completing and when I was going over with Michael what passages to talk about, you know, he gave me Ephesians 4. He said, what do you want, what do you want to go over? What do you want to preach? And so we went over the first half of chapter 4, and I was like, this, you know, this is cool, but it's, it's not, I, I felt like I couldn't relate. And then we hit the, the later half of chapter 4, which is verses 17 to 32. And I was like, boom, Michael, give me this. I want to do it. Because that is my life story. Now, I gave you a little intro about myself, but by the time we're over, you're practically going to know everything about me through these verses. And so my hope is that when we understand when we obey God's higher calling for us, there's three takeaways I want us to have. The first is that when we obey God's higher calling for us, we're able, to, we're able to have a firm foundation in Christ, and we're able to have a firm faith. 
The second point is that we're able to further strengthen our relationship with God. Because we know that in order to strengthen our relationship with God, we need to follow His will for us. We need to follow His plan. And the last one I'm going to be talking about is that when we obey God's higher calling for us, we learn to love one another better. And I think that's what the world needs right now, right? We know that we need to be able to love each other, to encourage each other in times of need. So let's get started. This is my first time using clickers. I hope this works. All right, point number one is to stand firm in our faith. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, it says, So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So right off the bat, we see that Paul, who wrote Ephesians, we see he's calling out the Gentiles, right? But he's not just calling them out to describe what they are. He's telling us what we should not be, right? He's saying the Gentiles lack awareness, that they have indulged in greed, that they simply do not care what they're doing. As Christians, are we taught to focus on money? No. As Christians, are we taught to focus on on lust, are we are we taught to you know put our part priority in things that don't matter? Whereas the Gentiles, this is what they're doing. They're prioritizing things that they don't that we should care about, but they don't. And you can see that in the last verse in verse 19 it says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So it says, so it says they have given themselves over. But the point here that Paul is telling us is that we should not be just handing ourselves over to the temptations of this world, to the deceptions that Satan might have for us. The point that Paul wants us to tell us is that we need to put our foot down and stand firm. Yes, there are things that are going to tempt us in life that may look more pleasing than following God. But if we aren't able to stand firm in our faith, then what faith do we have at all? In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now this is a very famous verse, right? We are called as Christians not to conform to the, excuse me, conform to the society or environment around us. It's important that no matter what happens, we're able to have faith in God. Whether when life gets tough or we try to find an easy way out, we know that God's going to be there. And this is something that I struggled with early on in my middle school and high school life. I know that Lauren told me, or she just explained to you guys that you know, she's, she saw me as a leader for middle school and high school. And I, I guess what I'm about to say might sound redundant because she didn't know me at school. But it was rough. Middle school and high school for me was rough. Because it was a new environment and all I cared about was everything but God. I cared about looking good. I wanted to have the latest you know, phone or the latest DS Lite back when it was popular. I wanted to be I wanted to you know hang out with all the girls. I wanted to be the best athlete. But being close to God or having a firm faith was dead last. Because I was so focused on prioritizing things that didn't matter that I was easily tempted by what the world wanted me to be or what the world wanted me to be. And we know that Jesus is what he calls us to be in the world and not of the world. Because when we're of the world, we, we, we conform to what people want us to be. Rather, when we're in the world, we're there to help change people's perspectives. Tell them that this is not the way we're supposed to go, that Christ has something better for us, a higher calling. And that was a struggle for me because I constantly chased something that didn't exist. Because we know when we follow God, when we are Christians, popular doesn't matter to God, fame does not matter to God, money, status, your income, none of that matters to God. All that God cares about is how strong is your faith and how firm your foundation is when of times of trials or obstacles or hardships. And that's what God sees. But I was young. I grew up in a pastor's household. I went to church every Sunday, but yet I still went away from God. And there is a, there is hope because I'm no longer, you know, I don't waver under pressure 
I'm not persuaded to do things that I don't do. I'll get into that next. But this is why we need to have a firm faith. Because there's going to be a time where someone will ask you, hey, are you Christian? And you might be persecuted for it. We look at the, we look at the disciples. All of them went out knowing that they were going to die for Christ. None of them went out and said, you know what? I'm not Christian. Don't kill me. Don't persecute me. None of them did that. So most of them went out being stoned to death, they were crucified. But because they believed in what they followed, which is Jesus Christ, they didn't care about the pressure of the world back then. And neither should we. And that's why if we're able to stand firm, we're obeying God's higher calling for us. Going to my next point, which is when we obey God's higher calling for us, our relationship with God becomes stronger. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20-24, Paul says that however is not the way of life you learned, when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so again, Immediately, Paul is telling us we cannot conform to the society around us because our old self that has our old habits and old routines, that is us conforming. Rather, we should be putting on a new self, as Paul tells it, in the image of Christ. Because when we keep developing bad habits or old habits, all we do is become further and further away from God. If I'm chasing money, if I'm chasing fame, I lose focus. My relationship with God becomes weak so when I need to go to him, my relationship isn't strong. And that was my biggest issue going up. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. But I didn't have a faith in middle school and high school. Like our previous VC said, I was a Sunday Christian. If you don't know what a Sunday Christian is, it means that you are a Christian on Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday, you're exactly the opposite. And that was me. Because I didn't care. I didn't care about how strong my relationship with God was. Even though my dad was a pastor, even though I was going to Sunday school, even though I was going to our youth group, I didn't care. And because of that, I developed a bad, I developed bad habits that made me further from God and weakened my relationship with God. There is a stereotype that pastors and kids tend to be rebellious. That's so much true. That, that was me. And I didn't realize how rebellious I was. In high school, I didn't go to a private Christian school or a private Catholic school where, you know, everyone, not everyone is Christian in high school. So I hung out with people. They were cursing, you know, they were gossiping, they were trash talking, and all these things. And I was like, oh, if I want to be popular, I need to do that too. Because I promise you, in my high school, none of the popular kids were Christian, by far. But I didn't care about being Christian. I cared about being popular. I didn't care about having a strong relationship with God. And so one day, someone called me out. I was having lunch with this individual during our lunch break. And you know, it was, it was a very regular conversation. They asked me, oh, Michael, what do you do in your free time? What do your parents do? And I told them, oh, my dad's a pastor. I go to church on Sundays, sometimes Saturdays. And I'm a Christian. And they looked at me. They were like, you? You. I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian. My dad's a pastor. What did you get about that? Is there something wrong? He said, there's nothing wrong with that except you don't act like a Christian. I remember that just like stabbed me in the heart. And what was worse about that is the person that called me out wasn't a Christian. So that spoke volumes to me. Because if a Christian came up to me and said that, I could have went, well, I do know that Christians are supposed to judge each other and condemn each other, so therefore you are a sinner. <laughs> I knew the Christian lingo. Like I said, I grew up in a pastor's house. I knew it all. I knew how to get by. But because this person wasn't Christian, it hit me harder. And at that moment, I realized that my relationship with God was nothing. Because of how far I went from God. Now, granted, God still loved me, and that's why I'm here today. But I did the opposite of what I was supposed to do. In that moment, what I realized is that all of us in this room, we are a reflection of the church. We 
we are a reflection of Jesus Christ, and we are a reflection of God. For me, I was a reflection of my parents. My dad's a pastor, like I mentioned. And in that moment, I felt like I failed three things. My family, the church, and my friends who were Christian. Because like Lauren said, she saw me as a leader, but I didn't see myself as that. I saw someone who just wanted to be a follower with the rest of the crowd, who was conforming to society, who had a weak faith, and because of that, I was the way that I was. But by the grace of God, I had someone who I wasn't even close with call me out. And from that moment, I realized something needs to change. If I want to be a leader, if I want to be more like Christ, if I want to stand firm in my relationship with my faith, then I need to take my faith seriously. I cannot keep doing the same old bad habits that would make me further away from God. Yes, it might be hard, but we all know as Christians, there are going to be sacrifices we need to make to be better. To live a better life that God calls us to, which is a higher calling. And so in high school, I gave up a lot. I remember this is my senior year. And usually the, the way people are is that it's their senior year, they, they go party, they're doing all these things. And for me, it was hard because I was balancing trying to not do that, but also knew that I had to stand alone. But one thing was clear was that if I wanted to strengthen my relationship with God, if I wanted to obey that higher calling, I had to stand alone. And that's what I did. And it was hard. I lost a lot of friends because I chose to separate, my, separate myself from the pack. But the payoff was much better. And now I can stand here saying that I didn't give in to temptation when my friends wanted me to go out to party. That I was able to strengthen my relationship knowing that I could stand alone in moments of hardships, but be proud that I am a Christian, that I am a Christ follower, that my relationship with God is stronger than ever. And that's what Paul wants us to think. That's what Paul wants us to do. Paul wants us to understand that there are going to be times where you have to stand alone. That you cannot be tempted by greed, by sensuality, by lust, by money, by fame. That you need to stand alone when the rest of the pack is going the opposite direction. I hope that we can all relate to that too. I hope that there's never a time where we're competent thinking that, you know, I'm a good, I'm a good person, I'm a good Christian, I don't need to learn anything new. Because God is always humbling us, and God is always showing us how we can strengthen our faith. Right? How can we be right there in sync with God, knowing His every step? And that's why when we obey God's higher calling, we're able to strengthen that. Right? We're able to develop an unbreakable bond. When you work out, you work out because you want to be stronger. And the same way with being a Christian, we need to do things that really test our faith, that really make us work. But when we get there, when we get over that hump, we can say that, man, that was, there's nothing that can stop me. And you look back and you can see how much you've grown. Going into my third point, when we obey God's higher calling for us, we're able to love one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 28, it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are so angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. One thing I love about Ephesians, and specifically this passage, is that Paul is very straightforward. The passages that I'm speaking about, there is no trick question or trick answer. It's not vague. It's very, very dark and straightforward. And Paul says it how it is. Don't be angry. Don't be mad. Find a way to figure out your frustration. How do you resolve conflict with, between your neighbor or your brother or sister in Christ? That's how Paul's giving it. And I understand that sometimes emotions can get the best of us. You, you might look at me and think, well, Michael, you know, he doesn't seem angry. But when I was younger, I used to be a very angry little boy. And it wasn't always like this. But a lot of it had to do with the way I was growing up. Not, 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 not my parents, but I played basketball. Okay? And my coaches, they weren't the best coaches. They would curse at us. They would yell at us. They would make us feel bad. They would practically make us feel like we were worthless on the court. But if I wanted to be better, we know that basketball is not a soft sport. You have to have a hard shell. You need to have passion, motivation, 
dry, right? You have to have that mama mentality. But I didn't have that naturally when I first started playing basketball. And then it developed as I just started playing with coaches, with people who were just trying to be better. And it made me more angry because I wanted to be better. But the only way I saw fit to be better was to be like them, to be like a coach, to just absolutely destroy my teammates, to talk trash to them, to be angry every time I miss the layup or I miss the shot. And that's how we get better. And it was hard because I ended up hurting myself and I would hurt people around me. We know that what Paul's saying here is don't let the sun go down on your anger, but that's what I did. When I'd be angry at basketball, I would let it be, I would let it bleed into other areas of my life. Whether it was my friends or my family, I would just be so mad. And I could physically see it too. And this next part, which is the part that says, do not give the devil a football. What that means is that do not let the devil have an advantage over your anger. Figure out a way to overcome it. And Pastor Lauren has actually mentioned this, I don't know how many years ago, but I can't. She just talked about when we're angry, find a way to put out the, the flame to the, the, I forget what she said, but it's try to take out the fire as soon as possible. Right? Don't let it explode. But that's exactly the opposite of what I did. I would always let it explode. And every time I did, I let a friendship burn and die. This past, this past uh, March, early March, late February, I actually had, you know, a conversation that was that led me to figure out, okay, how do I want to address my anger? And it was hard because this is something that, that I was dealing with maybe for five, six months, and because of it, I, I let the anger overcome my life. I was, you know, emotionally drained, physically and mentally, I wasn't doing well. Spiritually, I definitely wasn't doing well. I, I, I couldn't sleep. And I just remember being so angry at night that I would try to sleep it off, but I would just wake up the next morning and be really mad. And I remember I had a meeting with Pastor Lauren about this, and I was telling her, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm at odds here because I'm angry, I've tried everything that I could think of at the time. And I think the best part about that was that Pastor Lauren just had told me, have you gone to God about this? And every time I meet with Lauren, or Pastor Lauren, excuse me, she always calls me out, which is great. She tells me, Michael, have you been going to God? The answer was the same, no. <laughs> And she was like, okay, Michael, well, if you want to solve this, right, if you do not want to let the anger overcome you, what are you going to do about it differently? And so we took about five to ten minutes praying together. And the first thing that God told me was, go talk to this individual. Just do it. Because that's the simple answer. For, for whatever reason, I always like to make it complex. I like to hold in my frustration. I like to think that I deserve to be angry and that I can blow up on a person. But in that moment, God was telling me, Michael, Go talk to this individual. I remember Satan was, you know, knocking on the door telling Michael, don't do it, don't talk to this individual. You have every right to be angry, you have every right to be frustrated. And you have the angel on my left shoulders telling him, it's okay, just ignore Satan. Do what you, God has told you to do. And after that, after having this conversation with this individual, I remember my life changed drastically because I saw how God worked. Because in, in the moments leading up, I really thought this was a, an impossible conversation to have because of how frustrated and angry it was. But then I realized that God had shown me so much more in the conversation. He made me realize that I was mad, that I should have never been frustrated, that I became a bad friend to this individual, that instead of me calling out this person, it was me asking for forgiveness because that's what God wanted me to do. I realized that I was led down the wrong path not them. Because Satan was just taking advantage of my anger, making sure that I could do everything in my power not to have this conversation. I remember just, you know, talking to Pastor Lauren prior to this conversation, and the one thing I prayed over was this, that Satan had no power where I was in this conversation with my friendship. I remember this wasn't a, a question mark prayer, it was a statement of confidence saying that Satan has no power here. Because sometimes we forget that the Satan or the devil is working, but we don't see it. But in the moments leading up to that conversation, I pray that Satan, you have no power here. You can't do anything to affect the outcome of this conversation because I care about this person a lot. And since then, I felt like it was a weight lift off my shoulders. 
I was able to have good sleep. You know, my spiritual health was better, my mental health was better, my physical health was better. But it's because God had told me, don't be angry. Show grace, show love. Because you, as in me, I'm not perfect. I know that there are people who are frustrated with me. So I don't deserve, and I should not be angry at this individual. In Psalm chapter 37, verse 8, it says, No, refrain from your anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret if these only to evil. I think this is true because if we sleep on our anger, if we do nothing about our frustration, we will have hostile intentions. We will have negative ideas of you know, what we should what what we should be doing about our anger. But that's not what God calls us to do. Again, the sermon is about a hard calling. Having a decision or having a choice on should we refrain from anger or should we choose to be angry? In James chapter 4, verse 11 through 20, uh, sorry, verse 11 through 12, it says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now this was also a struggle for me because as I transitioned from my senior year into my freshman year of college, I was doing my best to truly be the best Christian I could be. You know, sacrificing things I knew that I should be doing. Um, you know, going to Sunday service and actually not falling asleep. I was making an effort to be a better Christian. But the one thing that I failed to do was to love others in a way that uplifted them or that encouraged them. We know that Christians can sometimes be very judgmental. They can be condemning. Maybe they don't mean it, but it comes off in a way that instead of encourages us to be better, it discourages us. And that was me. Now, the last two years at EPU, which stands for Azusa Pacific University, I had an opportunity to live on campus with some of my friends. And I said yes. I went and told my other friends about this. They looked at me and they were like, Michael, are you sure you want to live with them? I was like, yeah, it's fine. But they said, Michael, like, no, do you want to live with them? Because they're notoriously known for partying. You know, they do X, Y, and Z. Are you sure you want to put yourself in this environment? And I looked at them and I said, you know what? As crazy as it seems, I feel like God's calling me to this. Now, at the time, I didn't really know why. But I just felt like, you know what? I don't have a problem living with these people. And as the year progressed, I just saw how my relationships with my roommates changed. They had asked me, hey Michael, do you want to go out and do a devotion? Do you want to go to a coffee shop and read the Bible together? And that, that was, you know, it was amazing because when I would tell people these stories, they didn't believe me. They're like, yeah, right. So once I read the Bible, you're funny. But I told them, no. Guys, the whole, the whole idea here is not to condemn or judge people, but to love them, give them a chance. And if I chose to share to my roommates, hey guys, you're partying too much, you know what the Bible says, you guys are all sinners, I promise you I would be kicked out of the house. I promise you they would be like, yeah, we don't want Michael, he, he's too, he's a, a goody two shoes, like, let's, let's find someone who parties with us. But I didn't say that. All I did was I showed love with them, if they needed me, I would be there for them. And I didn't, I didn't judge them or condemn them for any of their actions. And because of it, I was able to strengthen my relationship with them for God, being able to read the Bible more and more together. And that's why it's so important to learn how to love one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for, helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. And again, Paul is very straightforward here. Paul lays it out for us. He's, he goes into detail of what kind of rage or what kind of frustration we should, get, we should be getting rid of. And you know, he's telling us, don't gossip. Right? Don't even spiritually gossip, because we know that that's a thing. You know, don't do things that will tear people down. Right? We should be doing things that uplift each other, that bring us closer, that help us love one another. Because again, what are we are we are called to love one another. Right? 
That's what it says. We are called to love one another, and we're called to forgive each other out of love. And as I mentioned before, I was a very, very angry little kid, especially in basketball. Now, I had this bad habit of, every time I missed the layup, there would be a cushioned wall against the basket. I would go up and slam it really hard, or I would pound the wall really hard on the floor, and I would let everyone know that I was angry. I remember my mom telling me, like, Mike, you have a bad habit of letting people know you're mad. It's really bad. And I would tell them, okay, and I don't even care. <laughs> um, but she was right because I would let anger get the best of me, right? And not only that, I would have a wholesome talk come out of my mouth. I would tell my teammates, why did you miss that shot? Or why did you pass the ball to him and not me? And I was pointing fingers and I was basically belittling my teammates and making them feel worthless, just as I had felt with my coaches. But in Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24 through 25, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on to our love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now this is the whole point of being a Christian is that, again, we are called to a higher calling, but what is it that we're doing to help each other with? Because we know that being a Christian is not a selfish, self, selfish relationship with God. It is, we are all under one body. We are called to be together, to uplift each other, to encourage each other, to support each other, whether you know, we're going through a hard time or a good time. And it was hard because I basically had to relearn all of this. I had to relearn how to love my friends and my family. I had to relearn how to forgive others. I had to relearn how to act properly according to Christ because that was not the way I grew up acting. Now, if I acted from like, if I acted like this from the start, my story would be nothing like this at all. But because I was able to have that opportunity to see where did I fail and how can I be better. Fast forward to today, I still love playing basketball. And one thing I work really hard on doing is not being mad. There's really nothing to get mad over. You know, I love playing with my friends, I love laughing with them. But I just remember how hard it was for me to not take basketball seriously as I did. Not to be angry, not to say so and so, you are terrible at basketball. And just the other, just the past Wednesday or two Wednesdays ago, you know, we were playing basketball with our church league. I remember we lost eight games in a row. We got absolutely blown out. Now, high school Marco would never let that happen because I would just be really mad. I would tell my teammates that you guys are terrible. But now, with the current Marco, I just remember being laughing. Like, you know, we got blown out. Sure, we were the youngest people there and we got blown out, but we were having fun doing it as weird as it sounds. We had fun losing because we were laughing with each other. Every time we airballed, we would just laugh. I missed the layup, and I remember I had a split second to think, okay, if I miss this layup, then I'm gonna hit the wall. I remember I went up to the wall, I looked at it, and I just gave a little pat. There's my friend. <laughs> the wall is now my friend. <laughs> but it just goes to show, like, I, I worked super hard to get to where I am. And it brings me joy seeing that, you know, my friends, they tell me, Michael, there's, there's really no way I would have known that you were a, such a little rage monster when you were younger because you exemplify just being happy or doing your best to you know, give people laughs. You know, I don't want to be known as someone who's angry. And that's how God doesn't want to know you either. God wants to see each and one of you guys as someone who succeeds, being able to love one another, being able to strengthen your relationship, and being able to stand firm in your faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and mold each other up, just as in fact you are doing. One thing I love about following Jesus and you know, being a Christ follower is that we don't have to do this alone. We know that we always have God who has our back, and we also know we have each other. That the best form of love is just keeping each other accountable. Knowing that, hey, if you mess up, I'm there with you. Right? Don't go the other route of, hey, you messed up? You deserve it. You made a big mistake. Sinner. Don't do that. Right? It's, hey, how can I keep you accountable? How can we keep each other accountable? How can I be responsible? Or how can we be better? Right? It's always about the, of, of lifting each other, encouraging each other, supporting each other. And that's what God does to us. God is not an angry God, right? Paul doesn't say that God becomes angry with us when we mess it up. Paul says that we should not be angry when we mess up. We should, not be, we should not be angry at others when we mess up. Because, because God shows 
we grace just as he shows the rest of us grace. That there is no exception. The grace we receive and the mercy and the love is equal. So I want us to go, I want us to take away that, that regardless of where you are in life, God is always going to be on your side. But he's always going to be telling you, hey, I know you can do better. That I have a higher calling for you that I want you to follow. Because when you take this route, you're going to unlock a door full of promises and rewards. And if you don't believe, you know, that, well, just look at me. I was in a very dark place. I am a walking testimony of what happens when you don't follow God, transforming into someone who follows God. But God never gave up on me. Right? I want to talk about hope. And I think that this speaks for everyone, that there's always going to be hope. You can be across the world, try to run away from God, but God's going to be right there. There is nowhere you can go that God's not telling you, hey, I'm still here. I still want you to be better. Let's do this together. It's not you're on your own, figure it out, figure it out yourself, but it's I'm right here. We're going to do each step with each other. I'm going to help you get a firm foundation in God. I'm going to help you strengthen the relationship with me, and I'm going to help you learn how to look, how to love one another. And in closing, now this is such a great passage. Like, like I said before, I love Ephesians and I love chapter 4 because it's very straightforward. Paul wants us to understand that these are three things we need to do when we choose to obey God's higher calling for us. That is black and white, it's very straightforward. That we should not be overthinking this. Like Warren said, you know, just do it. Just do it. Just love one another. Just make the choice that will make your relationship with God stronger. Make the choice that will help you build a firm foundation. Just do it. And so again, I want to thank you, know, you all for, for being here. I want to thank you know, Warren and Pastor Warren and Michael and the prayer team for allowing me to be a people because I am very, you know, very hopeful. That Revive is a service for people of all generations that can come together, regardless of where you are. That if you look at Revive, it is the intergenerational inter church that not, there's not one single patriot, but we are all here under one reason, and that's God. So I want us to remember that, that we have each other, right? That God is rooting for you every single day, every single second. And there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from God. And God is only asking you to choose the choice that He has planned for you. Just do it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to pray. I want to pray for every single individual here at the Revive Service. That it is a blessing and a great opportunity to be able to speak your word, Lord. And that we pray that we know that we are always going to be called to a higher standard or a higher calling. We may not like it, but I pray that we see the opportunities and the rewards that come from following you, God. That we're able to stand firm in our faith, we're able to put our foot down and say, No, I will not be tempted by this. That we're able to strengthen our relationship from, from constantly making the right decision. That we're able to say, God, I want to have a strong relationship with you and be able to get there one day. And then when we choose to follow this higher calling that God has for us, we're able to love one another, spur each other on, encourage each other, getting excited about what we're doing with God, and being able to just keep pushing each other to be better, to be closer with God. So I want to thank you for just giving you know, me this opportunity to speak your words, Lord. I want to pray these, all these things. So as we enter into another time of prayer and worship, Lord, we just couldn't continue that prayer that you come and help us to renew our minds, renew our spirits, Lord God, so that we may love like you loved because you first loved us, to love our neighbor as ourselves, Lord God, to love our neighbor, Lord God, and so we just ask 
you come and help us to make our heart of hearts, hearts of flesh, to soften our hearts towards our neighbor, Lord God. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, in the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you.
listening to Michael, I was really appreciating your testimony and the transformation that God has been doing in your life. Um, it's been so uh, encouraging to hear how prayer has changed, how the power of prayer draws you back to know the story of the Lord. And I think it's so important for us to continue to always share our testimonies with one another because we need that.
goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And I pray that today that can be our prayer. That like Michael said, Satan has no power here. Satan has no power in our anger, in our depression, in our anxiety.